Some scientific ideas and their supporters have simply been on the wrong side of history, with the theories disproven or discredited by later knowledge or even by increasing ethical awareness. Here are five mistaken bits of science we got wrong, but not before causing, in some cases, immense harm. Number five, phrenology. A German physician called Franz Joseph Gall, born in 1758, theorized that the human brain is divided into 27 separate zones, with each zone responsible for particular functions and characteristics, creating configurations of lumps and bumps on the outside of the skull. He developed a method of fingertip exploration of individual skulls and conducted extensive studies of criminals and insane people to establish a pattern of diagnosis and prediction of behaviour. Phrenology has a science caught on and was promoted by celebrity novelists such as the Bronte sisters Bram Stoker and Sherlock Holmes creator Conan Doyle. As the practice gained traction, companies made phrenological checks of prospective employers, and in some cases, innocent people were jailed as a preventative measure. In court hearings, phrenologist expert witnesses could secure a criminal conviction based on the shape of someone's head. When, later on the decline in London, phrenology was revived when an enterprising American, Lorenzo Fowler, began conducting lecture tours, offering readings and sponsoring phrenology parties. Author Mark Twain attempted to expose him by arranging two readings, initially impersonating a humble working man, then later rebooking as himself with his famous white suit and confident bravado. Fowler's first reading had found Twain to be lacking in creativity and any sense of humour and suited to a mundane clerical job, while the second reading reinterpreted a cranial depression as a mountainous protrusion and indicative of his creative genius. Phrenology gradually declined as a reputable profession. The only good that it may have done was that mental patients were no longer seen as possessed and beaten regularly. They were now acknowledged as genuinely ill. However, 100 years later, phrenology was still to have massive tragic consequences when used by the Belgian colonial office in taking control of Rwanda in 1919. The colonizers used their mail order phrenology calipers to check the heads of their new subjects and officially proclaimed the Tutsi to be racially superior to the Hutu. Class distractions were created, rewarding the Tutsi with high status positions and disenfranchising the Hutu. The inequality created a militaristic Tutsi elite and led to the loss of up to 1 million lives, including 70% of the Hutu population during the 1994 Rwandan genocide. Number 4. Therapeutic Tobacco when tobacco was first introduced to Europe by Spanish traders around 1518, it was proclaimed a miracle drug which could cure most human ailments. Its importers enthusiastically promoted the plant as a native herbal treatment, and in particular the effectiveness of tobacco smoke enemas, which then became popular for the next 300 years. A range of illnesses from epilepsy to sinus and gastrointestinal disorders were touted as being successfully treated by tobacco smoke, although the native traders had only ever used it for constipation in their horses. While the smoke could be blown into any part of the body, depending on the procedure, for those who could afford it, smoke enemas became a regular treatment and were thought to be life-saving. Deceased bodies were also pumped with smoke in case a person could be revived following the return from the dead of a young woman who had met her end on the gallows. Anne Green, a servant girl, had been legally charged as responsible for the passing of a baby, who was actually stillborn. After her execution, a trainee surgeon noticed the slight movement of her fingers and administered a smoke enema, which revived her. 
she was granted a full pardon and became living proof of the miraculous treatment which soon became a widely respected medical procedure. Smoke enema huts were installed along the Thames and around lakes to provide resuscitation equipment for drowning victims. Clonic tobacco fumigation only lost popularity in the early 19th century when nicotine was found to impair blood circulation. However, free tobacco was still distributed during cholera outbreaks when even children were encouraged to puff away to dispel the cholera fumes. Now the toxicity of tobacco smoke is well known, although it is still a grown worldwide addiction, affecting over a billion people and causing premature illness and death. Number three, miasma theory. Until Pasteur told the world about microscopic bugs causing disease, it was widely believed that bad odors, poor personal hygiene, and even an impure mind and soul were to blame. That miasma theory maintained that all disease, including cholera, typhoid, and malaria, were caused by foul smells. Feelings ran so high against anti-miasma advocates that one, a Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, was done away with by prominent medicos, and even Florence Nightingale ridiculed the notion of invisible microbes spreading the infection. Semmelweis had noticed a high death rate in his childbirth clinic, where autopsies were also performed. He ordered the doctors to wash their hands in an antiseptic solution of chlorinated lime before delivering babies to prevent the spread of infection. Within two months, the death rate had declined from 20% to nil. However, Samuels was ejected from his post of senior resident in the clinic because the doctors objected to being told to wash their hands. Wherever Samuels worked after that, the death rate plummeted. But this only enraged his colleagues, who lured him to an insane asylum and ruthlessly had him eliminated. If Pasteur's indisputable proof of germs causing disease had been accepted by the medical community sooner, it would have prevented many deaths, including those of thousands of soldiers during Florence Nightingale's work in the Crimean War. Ten times more deaths there were from typhus, typhoid, cholera and dysentery than from war wounds, and she only much later advocated hand washing. Number two, eugenics. It was Charles Darwin's cousin who, in 1883, founded the science of eugenics. The name is derived from the Greek word eugenis, which means of noble race or birth. Francis Galton, a social scientist and statistician, developed the idea of controlled breeding of humans in order to improve the species. This would take place by selecting positive inherited traits, such as intelligence, creativity and nobility of spirit. The thinking was that defective individuals were to be sterilized in order to prevent propagation of their kind over generations, reducing crime and antisocial behavior. Galton had many prominent supporters from both the right and left of politics. They included politicians Winston Churchill and Theodore Roosevelt, economists John Maynes Keynes, poet W.B. Yeats and suffragette leader Emmeline Pankhurst. With the financial support of groups such as the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Institute, eugenics inspired legislation proliferated in the US, with the Eugenics Records Office established in a laboratory on Long Island. The millions of IBM index cards recording lineage and inherited conditions of individuals were used to justify intensification of the laws and sterilization programs, a system which was later marketed to Hitler's Nazi Germany. The Carnegie supported the so-called American Breeders Association even published a report which suggested a program of eugenicide, death by lethal gas chamber for the most hopeless genetic cases. By the time the eugenics program was eradicated in the US, over 60,000 individuals deemed unfit had been sterilized and the same number of marriages ruled illegal. Hitler, of course, continue with his own eugenics program. Number one, the missing link. Darwin was not only misquoted on the term survival of the fittest, which 
he did not invent. He also never suggested that humans are descended from simian species, the monkey and the apes. However, many archaeologists and paleontologists have attempted to find what is known as the missing link, a specimen which exemplifies the evolutionary transition from ape to human. In the late 1920s, Soviet biologist Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov decided to create his own living and viable missing link by crossbreeding humans with other primates, chimpanzees, orangutans and even gorillas. He had already produced strange hybrids such as Z-Donk, a zebra crossed with a donkey, and others such as a cow crossed with an antelope, and rabbits with rats. Ivanov had already been granted funding from Stalin for his so-called Human Z project and it was later emerged that Stalin was keen to breed a half-man, half-ape army which could have endless stamina and obey brutal orders unquestioningly. Ivanov and his son Ilya travelled to Africa to commence trials on the racial assumption that he would find better human subjects for cross-breeding there. Based in Conakry, then French New Guinea, the two rounds of the Ivanov's experiments were surrounded by scandalised speculation and questions from the French administration. Reportedly, female chimpanzees were inseminated with human sperm from local volunteers and, just as disturbingly, women subjects received sperm from male chimpanzees. With still no results, the Ivanovs were soon required by the French to leave the country and so returned to Russia. There, the Kremlin accommodated them in a laboratory in Georgia. However, with still no results from the experiments, the elder Ivanov was sent into exile, where he spent the remainder of his life. The consequences of these trials may have had devastating effects for humanity. It is now known that the simian or monkey version of the HIV or human immunodeficiency virus jumped the species barrier around the late 1920s and with Guinea as a likely place of origin. Rumours abound that the barrier was breached by cross-species reproductive activity rather than, as previously thought, handling of bushmeat, which had been happening for centuries. Ivanov's attempt to create the missing link may well have resulted in the global pandemic of AIDS, so far having claimed 35 million lives.